Course in Miracles, Original Edition, Chapter 11, Section 8, The Guide for Miracles. Miracles demonstrate that learning has occurred under the right guidance. Because learning is invisible, and that means that what has been learned can be recognized only by its results. What has been learned can be recognized only by its results. Learning is invisible. Miracles demonstrate that learning has occurred under the right guidance. Learning's generalization is demonstrated as you use learning in more and more situations. You will recognize that you have learned that there's no order of difficulty in miracles when you have applied miracles to all situations. There is no situation to which miracles do not apply. And by applying miracles or truth to all situations, you will gain the real world. By applying truth to all situations, you will gain the real world. For in this holy perception of the real world, you will be made whole. And when you are whole, then wholeness will radiate from your acceptance of it for yourself to everyone the Holy Spirit sends you for your blessing. In every child of God, God's blessing lies. And in your blessing of the children of God, is God's blessing to you. Everyone in the world must play their part in the redemption of the world to recognize that the world has been redeemed. You cannot see the invisible. Yet if you see the invisible's effects, you know the invisible must be there. By perceiving what the invisible does, you recognize the invisible's being. And by what the invisible does, you learn what the invisible is. You cannot see your abilities, but you gain confidence in the existence of your abilities as your abilities enable you to act and the results of your actions you can see. The Holy Spirit is invisible, but you can see the results of Holy Spirit's presence. And through the results of Holy Spirit's presence, you will learn that Holy Spirit is there. What Holy Spirit enables you to do is clearly not of this world. And the reason why what Holy Spirit enables you to do is clearly not of this world is because miracles, which means right thoughts, violate every law of reality as this world judges reality. In other words, every law of time and every law of space and every seeming law of magnitude and mass and every seeming law of prediction and control is transcended because what the Holy Spirit enables you to do is clearly beyond all of those so-called worldly laws. And perceiving Holy Spirit's results, you will understand where Holy Spirit must be and finally know what Holy Spirit is. You cannot see the Holy Spirit, but you can see Holy Spirit's manifestations. And unless you do see Holy Spirit's manifestations, you will not realize Holy Spirit is there. Miracles are Holy Spirit's witnesses, and miracles speak for Holy Spirit's presence. What you cannot see, 
becomes real to you only through the witnesses who speak for it. Because you can be aware of what you cannot see. And what you cannot see can become compellingly real to you as the presence of what you can't see becomes manifest through you. So, do the Holy Spirit's work because you share in Holy Spirit's function. As your function in heaven is creation, so your function on earth is healing. God shares his function with you in heaven, and the Holy Spirit shares his function with you on earth. Now, as long as you believe you have two functions, so long will you need correction. For this belief that you have two functions is the destruction of peace. And this belief that you have two functions is a goal in direct opposition to the Holy Spirit's purpose. You see what you expect, and you expect what you invite. And your perception is the result of your invitation. And so your perception comes to you as you sent for it. Whose manifestations would you see? Of whose presence would you be convinced? Because you will believe in what you manifest. And as you look out, so will you see in. Two ways of looking at the world are in your mind, and your perception will reflect the guidance you chose. I am the manifestation of the Holy Spirit, and so when you see me, it will be because you have invited God, because God will send you God's witnesses. God will send you his witnesses if you will but look upon them. Remember always that you see what you seek. For what you seek, you will find. The ego finds what it seeks, and the ego finds only what it seeks. And so the ego doesn't find love, because love is not what your ego is seeking. Yet seeking and finding are the same. And if you seek for two goals, you will find two goals, but you will recognize neither. You won't recognize either of the two goals that you seek and think you find because you will think that the two goals that you find are the same and you will think the two goals that you find love and fear are the same because you want them both you will find love and fear because you are seeking love and fear but you will think love and fear are the same because you want both love and fear now the mind always strives for integration and so if your mind is split and if your mind wants to keep the split, your mind will believe, your mind will believe that it has one goal by making it one. We said before that what you project is up to you. But it's not up to you whether to project because projection is a law of mind. Perception is projection, which means you look in before you look out. As you look in, you choose the guide for seeing, and then you look out and behold its witnesses. 
This is why you find what you seek. This is why you find what you seek. What you want in yourself, you will make manifest by projection. And then you will accept it from the world because you put it there in the world by wanting it. When you think you are projecting what you do not want, it is still because you do want it. This leads directly to dissociation because it represents the acceptance of two goals. Each goal perceived in a different place, separated from each other because you made them different. Now your mind sees a divided world outside itself, but not within. Seeing a divided world outside yourself, but not within yourself, gives your mind an illusion of integrity, which means enables your mind to believe that your mind is pursuing one goal, like love. Perceiving the world outside as split, but not seeing your own mind as split between love and fear gives your mind an illusion of integrity and enables you to believe that you are pursuing only one goal. You think that you are pursuing only one goal called love, not realizing that you have a split goal. You have two goals and your mind is split between those two goals, love and fear. But you project the split and think that you are only pursuing one goal, love, giving your mind an illusion of integrity. Now, as long as you perceive the world as split between love and fear, then you are not healed. Because to be healed is to pursue one goal. Because you have accepted only one goal, which means you want only one goal, love. And when you want only love, then you will see nothing but love. And the contradictory nature of the witnesses you see is merely the reflection of your conflicting invitations. You have looked upon other minds and accepted opposition there in other minds, having sought opposition there in other minds. But don't then believe that the witnesses for the opposition you see in them are true, because the witnesses to opposition that you see in them only attest to your decision about reality. They only attest to your split mind. They, what you see in them, their split mindedness is just the witnesses that are attesting to your decision about reality. And all those witnesses are doing is returning to you the message you gave to them. Love is recognized by its messengers. If you make love manifest, love messengers will come to you because you invited love's messengers. The power of decision is your one remaining freedom as a prisoner of this world. You can decide to see the world right. 
What you made of the world is not the world's reality. Because the world's reality is only what you gave it. You cannot really give anything but love to anyone or anything. Nor can you really receive anything else but love from anyone or anything. And if you think you have received something besides love from anyone or anything, it's only because you have looked within and thought you saw the power to give something else but love within yourself. And it was only this decision to give something but love that determined what you found because it was this decision to give something besides love. It was the decision of what you sought. You are afraid of me because you looked within and are afraid of what you saw. Yet when you looked within and were afraid of what you saw, you could not have seen reality because the reality of your mind is the loveliest, the loveliest of God's creations, coming only from God. Its power and grandeur could only bring you peace if you really looked upon it. The reality of your mind is the loveliest of God's creations. The reality of your mind coming only from God, the reality of your mind's power and grandeur could only bring you peace if you really looked upon your mind. If you are afraid of your mind, it is because you saw something that is not there in your mind. Yet in your mind, you could have looked upon me and all your brothers and sisters in the perfect safety of the mind which created us. Because we are there in your mind, in the peace of our Father, our Father who wills to project his peace through you. The Father who wills to project his peace through you. When you have accepted your mission to project peace, then you will find peace. You will find peace because by making peace manifest, you will see it. And the loving witnesses of peace will then surround you because you called upon the witnesses of peace. And because you called upon the witnesses of peace, they will come to you. I have heard your call, and I have answered your call. But you won't look upon me, and you won't hear the answer which you sought. And you won't look upon me, and you won't hear the answer which you asked for, because you don't want only that answer yet. Yet, as I become more real to you, you will learn that you do want only my answer that you asked for and you will see me as you look within. And as you see me as you look within, then we will look upon the world as God created it together. Through the eyes of love, through the eyes of truth, only the real world, only the safe world exists and can be seen. 
as you decide, so will you see. And all that you see only witnesses to your decision. When you look within and see me, it will be because you have decided to manifest truth. And as you manifest truth, you will see truth both without and within. For you will see truth without because you saw truth first within. Everything you see outside you is a judgment of what you saw within you. If what you see within you is your judgment, then what you see within you will be wrong because judgment is not your function. If your judgment is the judgment of the Holy Spirit, then your judgment will be right because judgment is Holy Spirit's function. And so you share Holy Spirit's function only by judging as Holy Spirit judges, which means reserving no judgment at all for yourself. For you will judge, you yourself alone will judge against yourself. You yourself alone will judge against yourself. But Holy Spirit will judge for you, for you. Remember then that whenever you look without and react unfavorably to what you see, you have judged yourself unworthy and you have condemned yourself to death. The death penalty is your ego's ultimate goal because your ego fully believes you are a criminal and believing fully that you are a criminal, your ego believes that you are as deserving of death as God knows you are deserving of life. The death penalty never leaves the ego's mind because the death penalty is always is what is always what your ego reserves for you in the end wanting to kill you as the final of expression of its feeling for you your ego lets you live only to wait for death wanting to kill you as the final expression of its feeling for you your ego lets you live only to await death. And so your ego will torment you while you live, but your ego's hatred is not satisfied until you die. Because your destruction is the one end toward which your ego works, and your destruction is the only end with which your ego will be satisfied. Now, your ego is not a traitor to God to whom treachery is impossible. But your ego is a traitor to you. You who believe you have been treacherous to God. Your ego is not a traitor to God and your ego hasn't been treacherous to God. Your ego has just been treacherous to you because you believe you've been treacherous to God. That's why the undoing of guilt is an essential part, an essential part of the Holy Spirit's teaching. Because as long as you feel like you have been a traitor to God, 
and as long as you feel that you have been treacherous to God, you will feel guilty. And as long as you feel guilty, you are listening to the voice of the ego, which tells you that you have been treacherous to God, and so you do, therefore, deserve death. And you will think that death comes from God, not realizing that death comes from your ego because you have confused yourself with the ego. And because you have confused yourself with your ego, you believe that you want death. And from what you want, God does not save you. What you want, God doesn't save you. And so, when you are tempted to yield to the desire for guilt, when you are tempted to, to yield to the desire for death by feeling guilty, I want you to remember that I did not die. And you will realize that I did not die when you look within and see me. Would I have overcome death for myself alone? And would eternal life have been given me of the Father unless the Father had also given it to you? When you learn to make me manifest, you will never see death. Because when you learn to make me manifest, when you learn to look within and see me, to see I didn't die because I live in you, then you will have looked upon the deathless in yourself. And you will see only the eternal as you look out upon a world that cannot die. Would you like to look out upon a world that cannot die? That will happen as you look within and see only the eternal. When you have looked upon the deathless in yourself. When you have looked within and see me and realize I did not die. Then you will look out upon a world that cannot die. Chapter 11, Section 9 Reality and Redemption Do you really believe that you can kill the Son of God? Do you really believe you can kill a Son of God? The Father has hidden his children safely within himself and kept his children far away from your destructive thoughts. The Father has kept his creations safely within himself and far away from your destructive thoughts. But you know neither the Father nor yourself because of your destructive thoughts. You don't know God, and you don't know God's creations because of your destructive thoughts. What do you mean, your destructive thoughts? Well, you attack the real world every day, and every hour, and every minute. And yet, you're surprised that you cannot see the real world, the loving world, the world that cannot die. If you seek love in order to attack love, you will never find love. Because if love is sharing, how can you find love except through love? Offer love and it will come to you. Because love is drawn to itself. Offer love and it will come to you 
because love is drawn to itself. Where does love come? It comes to love. So when you offer love, you will find love. But if you offer attack, then love will remain hidden because love can live only in peace. God's creations are just as safe as their creator because the creations of God know their creator's protection and so God's creations cannot fear. The Father's love holds the Father's creations in perfect peace and needing nothing God's creations ask for nothing yet the creations of God are as far from you whose self they are because you chose to attack them You're far from the creations of God because you chose to attack the creations of God. You chose to attack God's children. And so you're far from them. And who and what they really are has disappeared from your sight and into their creator. They didn't change, but you did. Because a split mind and all its works were not created by God. And a created mi a split mind and all its works could not live in the knowledge of love. When you made what isn't true visible, then what is true became invisible. Yet what is true cannot be invisible in itself. Because what the Holy Spirit sees, because the Holy Spirit sees it with perfect clarity, what is true cannot be invisible in itself because the Holy Spirit sees what's true with perfect clarity. What is true is invisible to you because you are looking at something else besides what's true. Yet it's no more up to you to decide what is visible and what is invisible than it is up to you to decide what reality is. What can be seen is what the Holy Spirit sees. The definition of reality is God's, not yours. God created reality and God knows what reality is. You who knew what reality is have forgotten. And unless Holy Spirit had given you a way to remember, you would have condemned yourselves to oblivion. But because of your Father's love, you can never forget God. Because no one can forget what God himself placed in their memory. You can deny what God himself placed in your memory, but you can't lose what God himself placed in your memory. And so, a voice will answer every question you ask and a vision will correct the perception of everything you see. Because what you have made invisible is the only truth. And what you have not heard is the only answer. God would, re God would reunite you with yourself. God wants to reunite you with yourself. And God did not abandon you in your seeming distress. 
You are waiting only for God and don't know it. Yet God's memory shines in your mind and God's memory shining in your mind cannot be obliterated. God's shining memory in your mind is no more past than future, being forever, always. And so you have only to ask for this memory and you will remember. Yet the memory of God cannot shine in a mind which has made the memory of God invisible and wants to keep it that way. Because the memory of God can dawn only in a mind that wants to remember, which means only in a mind that has relinquished the insane desire to control reality. The memory of God can dawn only in a mind that wants to remember, which means in a mind that wants to remember the shining memory of God, that's a mind that has relinquished the insane desire to control reality. You who cannot even control yourselves should hardly aspire to control the universe. Instead of that, look upon what you have made of the universe and rejoice that it is not so. Instead of trying to control the universe, just look upon what you've made of the universe and rejoice that it is not so, that it is not that way. Children of God, don't be content with nothing. What is not real cannot be seen, and what is not real has no value. God could not offer you what doesn't have any value, nor could you receive what has no value. And because of that, you were redeemed the instant you thought you had deserted God. Everything you made has never been, and everything you made is invisible because the Holy Spirit doesn't see everything you made. Yet, what Holy Spirit does see is yours to see. Everything Holy Spirit does see is yours to see. And through Holy Spirit's vision, through what Holy Spirit does see, what you see is healed. You have made the invisible the only truth that this world holds. You have made the invisible the only truth that this world holds. In other words, valuing nothing, you have sought nothing, and you have found nothing. By making nothing real to you, you have seen nothing. But what you've seen is not there. And Christ is invisible to you because what you have made visible because of what you have made visible to yourselves. Love is invisible. The self, yourself as God created yourself is invisible to you because of what you have made visible to yourself. Yet, it doesn't matter how much distance you have tried to interpose between your awareness and truth. It doesn't matter. You can be seen because your vision is shared. The Holy Spirit looks upon you and sees nothing else in you. What is invisible to you is perfect in love's sight and encompasses all of sight. All of Holy Spirit's sight. What is invisible to you is perfect in love's sight 
and it compasses all of love's sight. The Holy Spirit has remembered you. And the reason the Holy Spirit has remembered you is because Holy Spirit did not forget God. That's why Holy Spirit has not forgotten you. You looked upon the unreal and found despair. Yet by seeking the unreal, what else but despair could you find? The cruel world, the unreal world, is a thing of despair. The unreal world is a thing of despair because the unreal world can never be. And you who share God's being with him could never be content without reality. And that's why what God did not give you has no power over you. And the attraction of love for love remains irresistible to you. For it is the function of love to unite all things unto itself. It is the function of love to unite all things unto itself and to hold all things together by extending its wholeness. The real world, the world that cannot die, was given you by God in loving exchange for the world you made and the world which you see. The real world, the world that's not cruel, the world which cannot die, was given you by God in loving exchange, in loving exchange for the world you made and the world which you see. Only take the real world from the hand of love and look upon it. The reality of the real world will make everything else invisible because beholding the real world is is total perception which rem which means as you look upon the real world you will remember that that's all there is and that's all there ever was and nothingness will become invisible because once you behold the real world, you will at last have seen truly, at last. Corrected perception is easily translated into certainty, into knowledge. For only perception is capable of error, and perception has never been. Being corrected, perception gives place to certainty, to knowledge, which is forever the only reality. The plan for the healing of the guilt in your mind is just the way back to what was never lost. Your father could not cease to love you, his creation. Chapter 11, Section 10, Guiltlessness and Invulnerability. If you did not feel guilty, you could not attack, because condemnation is the root of attack. Condemnation is the judgment of one mind by another mind as unworthy of love and deserving of punishment. 
But herein lies the split. Because the mind that judges or the mind that condemns sees itself as separate from the mind being condemned, believing that by punishing the other mind, the mind that's condemning will escape punishment itself. And all this is, is just the delusional attempt of the mind to deny itself and to escape the penalty of condemnation. Condemning another mind as unworthy of love in, in a delusional attempt to condemn yourself, that's not an attempt to relinquish condemnation. That's an attempt to hold on to condemnation, condemning another mind as unworthy of love and deserving punishment as a way to escape punishment yourself. That is not an attempt to get rid of your own guilt. That's an attempt to hold on to your own guilt. Because it is guilt that has hidden God to you. And it is guilt that has driven you insane. The acceptance of guilt into the mind of God's creation was the beginning of the separation. Just like the acceptance of the release from guilt, the atonement, is the end of the separation, the detour into fear. And the world you see, it is the delusional system of those made mad by guilt. And so, look carefully at this world. And if you will look carefully at this world, you will realize that this world is the delusional system of those made mad by guilt. You will see that this world is the symbol of punishment. And all the laws that which seem to govern this world are the laws of death. You'll see that if you look carefully at this world. You'll see that children are born into the world through pain and in pain. You'll see that children's growth is attended by suffering and that children learn of sorrow and separation and they learn of death. And the children's minds, you'll see, seem to be trapped in their brain and you'll see that the children's, the power of the children's brain, you'll see its powers decline if their bodies are hurt. You will see that their minds seem to be trapped in their brain and you will see their minds power decline if their bodies are hurt so you will see if you really look at this world and you will also see if you really look at this world that the children seem to love yet they desert and are deserted. And you will see, if you really look at the world, that children appear to lose what they love. Perhaps the most insane belief of all. And if you look at this world, you will see that the children's bodies wither and gasp and are laid in the ground and seem to be no more. Now, not one of these people in the world on earth, not one of them has but thought that God is cruel. Now, if this were the real world, God would be cruel. No father could subject his children to this as the price of love and be loving. Love doesn't kill to save. If love did kill to save, then attack would be salvation. And attack is salvation. Attack is love. That is the ego's interpretation. It's not God's interpretation, though. 
Love does not kill to save. God does not kill his children out of his love for them. Now, only the world of guilt could demand this. Killing being the price of love. Because only the guilty could conceive of that, that death being the price of love. Adam's so-called sin could have touched none of you had you not believed that it was the father who drove Adam out of paradise. For in that belief that God drove Adam out of paradise, in that belief, the knowledge of God the Father was lost. Since only those who don't understand God could believe that it was God who drove Adam out of paradise. This world is a picture of the crucifixion of God's children. And until you realize that God's children cannot be crucified, this is the world you'll see. Yet you won't realize this. You won't realize that you cannot be crucified until you accept the eternal fact that you are not guilty. You will not realize that you and everyone else cannot be crucified, cannot be killed by the world until you accept the eternal fact that you are not guilty. You are not guilty because you deserve only love. And you deserve only love because you have given only love. You cannot be condemned because you have never condemned. And the atonement is the final lesson. The atonement is a lesson the atonement, which is the lesson that teaches that you cannot be guilty, you are not guilty, the atonement, the final lesson you need learn, teaches you that never having sinned, you have no need to be saved. Long ago we said, that the Holy Spirit shares the goal of all good teachers. All good teachers whose ultimate aim is to make themselves unnecessary by teaching their pupils all they know. The Holy Spirit wants only to teach you all that he knows, rendering himself unnecessary, because sharing the Father's love for you, Holy Spirit wills to remove all guilt from your mind, and Holy Spirit wants to remove all guilt from your mind so that you may remember your Creator in peace. See, peace and guilt are antithetical, which means the Father can be remembered only in peace. Love and guilt cannot coexist. And to accept one is to deny the other. Guilt hides peace from your sight. Guilt hides who you really are and who they really are from your sight. Because guilt is the denial of the blamelessness of yourself and others. Guilt is the denial of the blamelessness of you. Guilt is the denial of the blamelessness of you and them and everyone.
in this strange world which you have made, you have sinned. And in this strange world you've made, they have sinned. But how could you see them? How could you see them then, believing that they have sinned and you have sinned? How could you see them then? You made them invisible with your guilt and your condemnation. And by making the children of God invisible and by making yourself invisible, the world of retribution rose in the black cloud of guilt which you accepted and that you hold dear. Because the blamelessness of God's children is the proof that the ego never was and never can be. See, without guilt, the ego has no life. And you are without guilt. Now, as you look upon yourselves and judge what you do honestly, as you have been asked to do, you may be tempted to wonder how you can be guiltless. Yet consider this. You are not guiltless in time, but in eternity. You have, quote, sinned in the past, but there is no past. Always has no direction. Time seems to go in one direction, but when you reach time's end, time is going to roll up like a long carpet which has spread along the past behind you and disappear. As long as you believe you are guilty, you will walk along this time carpet believing that this time carpet leads to death. And the journey on the time carpet will seem long and cruel and senseless because that's what it is, long and cruel and senseless. The journey which you have set yourself is foolish indeed, but the journey on which God sets you is a journey of release and joy. The Father is not cruel, and so you cannot hurt yourself. You cannot hurt yourself. And so the retaliation you fear and the retaliation which you see will never touch you. For although you believe in the retaliation, the Holy Spirit knows the retaliation you fear and see is not true. The retaliation you fear and the retaliation you see is not true and Holy Spirit knows it. The Holy Spirit stands at the end of time where you must be because he's with you. Holy Spirit has always undone everything unworthy of you because that was Holy Spirit's mission. That mission was given him by God and what God gives has always been. You will see me as you learn that you are guiltless. You've always sought your guiltlessness and you have found your guiltlessness. Because everyone is seeking to escape from the prison they have made and the way to find release from the prison you have made is not denied you. The release from the prison you have made being in you, you have found it. Now, when you find release from the prison you have made that's within you, when you find that, that's only a matter of time. And time is just an illusion because you are guiltless now and the brightness of your purity shines untouched forever in God's mind. 
you will always be as you were created. And so deny your world and judge yourself not because your eternal guiltlessness is in the mind of God and your eternal guiltlessness protects you forever. When you have accepted the atonement, meaning the plan for the release from guilt in your mind, when you have accepted the atonement for yourself, when you have accepted the release from guilt for yourself, you will realize that there's no guilt in you. And only, only, only as you look upon yourself as guiltless can you understand your oneness. And the reason that only as you look upon yourself as guiltless can you understand your oneness is because the idea of guilt brings a belief in condemnation of one by another, projecting separation in place of unity. You can only condemn yourself. You can condemn only yourself. And by condemning yourself, you cannot know that you are God's son when you condemn yourself, you have denied the condition of your being, the condition of your being which is your perfect blamelessness. When you feel guilty, you cannot know that you are God's creation. Because when you feel guilty, you have denied the condition of your being the condition of your being, which is your perfect blamelessness. Out of love you are created, and in love you abide. Goodness and mercy have always followed you, because you have always extended the love of your Creator. As you perceive the beautiful companions who travel with you, you will realize that there is no journey, but only an awakening. You who sleepeth not have kept faith with your Father for you. There's no road to travel on and there's no time to travel through. Because God does not wait for you in time, because God's forever unwilling to be without you. And so it's always been. Let the sinlessness of God's children shine away the cloud of guilt that darkens your mind which means by accepting the purity of yourself and others, by accepting the purity of others as your purity, you learn of them that their innocence and blamelessness is yours. You are invulnerable because you are guiltless. You can hold on to the past only through guilt. For guilt establishes that you will be punished for what you have done, and so guilt depends on one-dimensional time proceeding from past to future. No one who believes in guilt can understand what always means. And therefore, guilt must deprive you of the appreciation of eternity. You are immortal because you are eternal and always must be now. Guilt then is a way of holding past and future in your minds to ensure the ego's continuity. Guilt is a way of holding your past and your future in your mind to ensure your ego's continuity. 
Guilt is a way of holding past and future in your mind to ensure your past's continuity. For if what has been will be punished, for if what has been will be punished, then the ego's continuity is guaranteed. Yet the guarantee of your continuity is God's, not the ego's. And immortality is the opposite of time, because time passes away while immortality is constant. Accepting the atonement, the plan to release you from guilt, the plan to correct guilt from your mind, accepting that plan teaches you what immortality is. For by accepting your guiltlessness, you learn that the past has never been, and so the future is needless. The future in time is always associated with expiation, and only guilt could induce the need, a need, of expiation. Only guilt could induce a sense of need for expiation for time to pass. Only guilt could induce a sense of need for time to pass. Accepting the guiltlessness of the children of God as your guiltlessness is therefore God's way of reminding you of yourself, which means what you are in truth. Because God has never condemned you, and being guiltless, you are eternal. You cannot dispel your guilt by making your guilt real and then trying to make up for it. That's your ego's plan, which your ego offers you instead of dispelling your guilt. The ego believes in correcting guilt through attack being fully committed to the insane notion that attack is salvation from guilt. And so you who cherish guilt must also believe that attack is release from guilt. Because how else but by identifying with the ego could you hold dear what you do not want? The ego teaches you to attack yourself because you're guilty. And this must increase your guilt because guilt is the result of attack. In the ego's teaching then, there is no escape from guilt because attack makes guilt real. And if guilt is real, there is no way to overcome guilt. The Holy Spirit dispels guilt simply through the calm recognition that your guilt has never been. And as Holy Spirit looks upon the guiltlessness of you, Holy Spirit knows that your guiltlessness is true. And being true for you, you cannot attack yourself. For without guilt, attack is impossible. You then are saved because you are guiltless and being wholly pure, you are invulnerable.